pioneer in a field where women like herself are often rendered invisible. If you're going to read only one book about AI, this should be it. So that is a ringing endorsement. <laughs> and um, I have to say, we with the Technology and Society program have been so happy to be there throughout Dr. Joy's journey and learning alongside her as she founded and launched the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, as you all know, AI is a hot topic right now and new to so many. But the core concerns at the heart of this conversation are something Dr. Joy and others have been warning us about for many years. So I'm incredibly grateful that Dr. Joy is here with us today to share her expertise. And before we get started, I just want to say a special thank you to my colleague Sun Yu and the entire Tech and Society team for helping to pull this event together, as well as Frankie and everyone from events and AV here at Ford. And we've also been really happy to partner with the Algorithmic Algorithmic Justice League, All Tech is Human, the Institute for Global Politics at uh, Columbia University for this event. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra from All Tech is Human to introduce our program. Thanks a lot, y'all. Hi, everyone. How are, how are you feeling? <laughs> Good? I'm very excited. Um, my name is Sandra Khalil. I'm the head of partnerships with All Tech is Human. I have the honor of introducing our guests today. Uh, Dr. Joy Bolamwini is the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, an AI researcher, and an artist. She is the author of Unmasking AI, My Mission to Protect What is Human in a World of Machines. Her MIT research on facial recognition technologies galvanized the field of AI auditing and re revealed the largest racial and gender disparities in commercial AI products at the time. Her TED Talk with over 1.6 million views on algor algorithmic bias served as an early warning for current AI harms. Her writing and work have been featured in publications including Time Magazine, she is on the inaugural list of Time 100 AI, New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and Rolling Stone. Dr. Bolamwini is the protagonist of the Emmy-nominated documentary, Coded Bias. She is a Rhodes Scholar, World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, and recipient of the Technological Innovation Award from Martin Luther King Jr. Center. Fortune Magazine named her the conscious of the AI revolution. Dr. Bolamwini earned a PhD and master's degree from MIT, her master's of science from Oxford University with distinction, and a bachelor's degree in computer science from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Sinead Bovell is a futurist and the founder of Way, an organization that prepares youth for a future with advanced technologies and a focus on non-traditional and minority markets. Shanae is a regular uh, tech commentator for CNN, talk shows, and morning shows. She's been dubbed the AI educator for the non-nerds by Vogue magazine. <laughs> and to date, she has educated over 200,000 young entrepreneurs on the future of technology. Shanae is an eight-time United Nations speaker. She has given formal addresses to presidents, royalty, and Fortune, Fortune 500 leaders on topics ranging from cybersecurity to artificial intelligence, and currently serves as a strategic advisor to the United Nations International Telecommunication Union on Digital Inclusion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay. <laughs> Woo, we made it! <laughs> we made it. Dr. Bolamwini, Joy, my friend, my fellow sister, this is such an honor. And I think to kick things off, you know, two terms that I think need to be a part of the everyday discourse that we all need to understand that really stood out to me in, our bo in your book. The first is the coded gaze. And the second is the X-coded. So what is the coded gaze and who are the X-coded? Got it. Great way to kick off. Before I address that, I just want to thank all of you for coming out for the first stop of the Unmasking AI Book Tour. Ford was the first. <laughs> 
Ford was the first foundation to support the Algorithmic Justice League. They supported my art. Actually, AJL has an uh, exhibition piece uh, here at the Ford Foundation Gallery, so please do check it out. And now, to the coded gays. <laughs> All right, so who's heard of the male gays, the white gays, the post-colonial gays? Okay, the coded gays extends on that, and it's really a question of who has the power to shape the priorities of technology, but also the prejudices that get embedded. And my experience of facing the coded gays was what you see on the cover. Uh, it was Halloween. I had a white mask around, and I was working on an art project that used face tracking, and it didn't detect my face that well until I put on the white mask. And I was like, dang, Fanon already said it, black skin, white mask. I just didn't think it'd be so literal. <laughs> and so that's what started this journey that became the Algorithmic Justice League. And really, we are focused on, to the second term, the X-coded. Right, so those who are condemned, convicted, otherwise exploited or excluded by algorithmic systems. And so the focus is how do we liberate the X-coded? How do we actually make sure that the benefits of artificial intelligence are for all of us, especially marginalized communities, and not just the privileged few? And so what are some of the ways algorithmic bias and discrimination or being a part of the X-coded could be impacting all of our lives. I mean, think of a ism and it's there, right? So you can think of AI uh, deciding who gets hired, who gets fired. Amazon had a hiring tool where they showed that if you had a women's college listed, you got deducted. There have been other hiring tools that have been evaluated. If your name's Jared, you play lacrosse, you might get some points, right? So, so that's one kind of an example. I also think about uh, AI systems within uh, medicine. And so you have these race-based uh, clinical algorithms that aren't actually based on the science, and people get denied uh, vital organs. So that's another space in which it can creep up. Education as well. You might be flagged as having used the chatbot. They show studies that actually you might be flagged not because you were cheating, but English, like me, could be your second uh, language. So those are some of the everyday examples in which people get X-coded. And then my work has focused a lot, as you, many of you know, on facial recognition technologies. So I think about people like Portia Woodruff, who was eight months pregnant when she was falsely arrested by AI-powered facial recognition uh, misidentification. So sitting in a holding cell, having contractions, when they finally let her out, she had to be rushed to the emergency room, right? So that's the type of algorithmic discrimination putting two lives uh, in danger. We could go on. It's a horror story. It's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> And there are some profound exa more examples in the book from a driverless vehicle, not, maybe not seeing you. The list goes on and on, and my jaw just dropped every one that I read. So in the book, you talk about your viral TED Talk, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And you also discuss some of the comments that you received. One such comment was, algorithms are math, and math isn't biased. So can artificial intelligence ever just be a neutral, objective tool? That's a great question, and I've had so many eye rolls. Even one of the book reviews was like, tell, you're telling me CPUs, computers are racist? So how can this happen, right? And in fact, I got into computer science because as cool as people are, people are messy. So I was hoping I could be in the abstract world and not really have to think um, too much about uh, bias. But when we look at artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning, approaches that are powering many of the systems we're seeing today, the machines are learning from data, the data reflecting past decision makers, right? And we know, let's say, the gatekeepers for who gets hired might not be so inclusive. And so that's where the bias starts to come in when you have systems that are looking for patterns and those patterns reflect a society. So I'm not saying one plus one doesn't equal what you think it was going to equal. But I'm saying once we're applying these types of systems uh, to human decision making, the bias creeps in. 
right? And I think that is something that we hear often, that technology is just a neutral tool and it's up to us for how, it gets, how we use it. But you make a really important point in your book that there are decisions that get made prior to the technology even being deployed. And those decisions, by very nature of doing things like classifying people, can't be neutral. And I think, yeah, that was a section that really stood out to me. Now, I want to read a quote from your book. And this quote gave me chills, so I thought that this would be the appropriate uh, section to read out. So seeing the faces of women I admired and respected next to labels containing wildly incorrect descriptions like clean shaven adult man was a different experience. I kept shaking my head as I read over the results, feeling embarrassed that my personal icons were being classified in this manner by AI systems. When I saw Serena Williams labeled male, I recalled the questions about my own gender when I was a child. When I saw an image of school aged Michelle Obama labeled with the description toupee, I thought about the harsh chemicals put on my head to straighten my kinky curls. And seeing the image of a young Oprah labeled with no face detected took me back to my white mask experience. You went on to say, I want people to see what it means when systems from tech giants box us into stereotypes we hoped to transcend with algorithms. So how you called attention to these specific stereotypes was through a poem you wrote called AI, Ain't I a Woman? Can you tell us more about this poem and what it means to be a poet of code? Oh, wow. That gave me chills just <laughs> reliving it. Kids are mean out there. I'd always be asked, are you a boy or a girl when I was growing up? So I think it's somehow ironic right, that this ends up uh, being uh, my research. So after I did the gender shade study at MIT, where I was doing my master's degree, and the results were published, the results had performance metrics showing, OK, for IBM, uh, for Microsoft, and then later on uh, for Amazon, these systems work better on men's faces versus women's faces, on uh, lighter faces versus darker faces. And then we did a little intersectional analysis, so extremely we saw that it didn't work as well on uh, the faces of dark-skinned women like me. And so when I observed that from the data, I wanted to move from performance metrics to performance arts to actually humanize what it means to see those types of labels. And that's what led to AI Ain't I a Woman. At first, I thought it would be an explainer uh, video like I've done uh, with other projects. And then I was talking to a friend, and they said, can you describe what it felt like? And as I started to describe it, he said, that sounds like a poem. So the next morning, I woke up with these words in my head. Um, uh, my heart smiles as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. I was like, ooh, something's happening, right? <laughs> so I kept, I kept going on, right? Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers? as we knew them, and the descriptions you just shared, right? So to see Sojourner Truth labeled a, a clean-shaven adult a male, those are the queens I was talking about. And that led to what my PhD ended up focusing on, which was both algorithmic audits, like the Gender Shades paper, which showed performance metrics, but also evocative audits like AI Ain't I a Woman, which humanizes what AI harms uh, look like or feel like. I love that you use that word, it humanizes. So when you decided to pursue algorithmic bias as the focus of your research, this was 2016. It wasn't a topic many had heard of, uh, and it certainly wasn't really discussed in the public. And then your work, it courageously takes on big tech or some of the tech giants uh, calling attention to some of the harms in their facial recognition systems. Some of the companies lashed out at you. And some researchers did come to your defense, like Dr. Tim Nickerbrew, someone that we also all adore and love. I know, shout out, shout out. <laughs> shout out <to> me. <laughs> but others were fearful to come to your defense, as were some of the academic labs, because they feared it would impact their ability to get funding or to get a job. So as a student pioneering in this research, how did you navigate this? And in your opinion, has the sentiment shifted? Or do fears over career repercussions still hinder open discussions about AI ethics? 
This is such a great question. I will say now that I lead an organization, I have more empathy for administration, right? And keeping things funded and all of that. At the time, as a grad student, um, I felt that uh, Timnit Gebru, Deb Raji, and I, we were really sticking our necks out. And I couldn't understand why more senior um, scholars and others weren't speaking up as much until I started to follow the money trails. So many of these large tech companies fund many computer science degree programs, particularly uh, PhDs. I happened to be in a place where my advisor didn't have a PhD. He was on a non-traditional path. I had aspirations of being a poet. So all of these things helped me not feel so much that if, um, if I poked the dragons and they were fire-breathing dragons, I would be completely uh, eviscerated. I do think there is still a fear of speaking out, but I do think the work of Gender Shades helped normalize this conversation so others could speak out. Gender Shades, one of the things I did, which I was cautioned against, was actually naming the companies. Usually you'd say company A, company B, company C, keeping my funding. Life is good, right? So to actually name it. But now this is a common uh, practice. And I also have to commend the senior academics who did come to our defense. And later on, I did hear that there was a cost um, to doing it as well. Yeah, I think you. I think the research with Gender Shades, it, all, it gives us data to point to and the terminology that we all need when we want to advocate uh, against some of these harms. So I have to ask it. There are many voices in the world of AI who believe that super intelligence uh, and the potential for AI to cause humanity to go extinct, those are the most important harms we should be paying attention to. So as someone who has dedicated their entire working life to combating harms in AI, are these the real risks we should be tuning into? X risk, when I think of X risk, I think of the X coded. So I think about the person who never gets the call back. Can you right? explain what X risk is to people? Oh, sure. Yes. Existen oh, you want me to talk about what the doomers? No, just explain. Yeah, X risk is just the existential risk kind of thing. Sure. So you've seen Terminator. Yeah, <laughs> people have seen Terminator. You've seen the headlines. It's the end of the world as we know it. AI is here. We're going to die. That's X risk. So AI could become so intelligent, right? It takes over the already powerful, and they become marginalized. This is my take on the X risk. <laughs> they become marginalized, and that would be terrible to face oppression, wouldn't it, right? So this is X risk as I see it. And I, what I noticed with doing this work since 2016 is sometimes there are intellectually interesting conversations that happen within theoretical uh, spaces, right? So what if? And then we continue from that what if. So we have that with what if AI systems become sentient, which they're not, right? What does general uh, intelligence uh, look like? And I think sometimes there can be a runaway narrative that is fictional, which doesn't reflect reality, but gets a lot of attention. And the problem with getting so much attention is it actually impacts the agenda for where funding and resources are going to go. So instead of seeing what we can do to help Portia Woodruff or Robert Williams falsely arrested in front of his uh, two young daughters, the money goes elsewhere. So that's kind of the danger that I see. I think it's one thing to have an interesting intellectual conversation, but that's not necessarily uh, what's going to help uh, people in the here and now. I like in the book how you label there's hypothetical risk, and then there's real risk that's existent today. Right, and one, one more thing I wanted to talk about, right? I've supported the campaign uh, to end killer robots. AI systems can kill us slowly. Mm -hmm. So thinking of structural violence, it's not the acute, you know, the bombs drop or the bullet is shot. It's when you don't have access to health care when you live in environments or housing conditions that worsen your life outcomes, right? And so there, when we see AI being used for those types of critical 
uh, decisions. That's a different kind of risk. Or you mentioned the uh, self-driving cars. You know, there was a study that came out showing height made a difference for accuracy. I'm like, dang, I'm with the kids and other short people, right? <laughs> We're at risk here. So th there are different ways. Um, and also, it doesn't just have to be biased AI systems. Accurate systems can be abused if we're, again, thinking lethal, autonomous uh, weapon system. You got a drone. You got a camera. You got facial recognition. Uh, if it's accurate, it might get me. If it's not accurate, it might still get me. It's still a problem. And would you support banning any types of AI technologies or AI-powered technologies? Uh, lethal autonomous weapons and uh, face surveillance, right? So it's not just recognition, but it could be systems that are tracking uh, your gender, your age, other uh, characteristics, for sure. So you've been in the documentary, Coded Bias. Uh, you were the face of the Olay Decode the Bias ad campaign. So from these experiences, what role do you see media having in these conversations that shape artificial intelligence or shape how we think about artificial intelligence? So I saw the power of media with AI Ain't I Woman because it traveled unsurprisingly much further than my research papers. <laughs> and I wanted to say, OK, how do we make uh, these findings more accessible, but also bring in more people into the conversation? I like to say, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation about AI because it impacts uh, all of us. And so the opportunity to be part of the Coded Bias documentary, I was a bit hesitant. But then when I saw people would reach out to the Algorithmic Justice League and say, oh, I'm studying data science because of you. I was like, dang, I got to go do my homework. But you know, like, I feel inspired too, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Decode the Bias was interesting. Here I was partnering with Procter & Gamble Olay, and they invited me to be part of an algorithmic audit. And I said, are you sure? Because based on what I know, we'll probably find bias. They're like, that's OK. And based on who I am, I'd like to make the results public, final editorial. Um, decision. They said, that's OK. I was only talking to the marketing team, so I don't know if the <laughs> other teams would have been as quick to say yes. Um, but long story short, we did that uh, audit, and we did find uh, bias of different types. And Olay committed to the consented data promise, which is the first of its type that I've seen uh, from any company. And so showing that there are alternative ways of building consumer-facing uh, AI products. It was inspired by their uh, skin promise, which I think it was the year or two after I started modeling for them. They decided there's going to be no more airbrushing or retouching, truth in advertising, which I support. Body image, I think, is great. But I won't lie. I was like, wait, OK, so nothing's going to save me. I was exercising, drinking water, sleeping, of course, doing my skincare regime. But I thought it had lessons for the tech industry as well, right? When you know that there, the standards are a little bit higher, you, you, you are forced to rise uh, to the occasion can't improve what you aren't measuring. Um, so I think we're all starting to wake up to the reality that most of these AI systems, whether it's a facial recognition system, an image generator, a chatbot, they're powered with our digital labor, AKA our data. What advice would you have to legislators on data privacy? And why might it not be enough if a company comes out and says, look, we're deleting your data. It's OK. It's all being deleted. Why might that not be enough? So I think of this notion of deep data deletion. So when we're looking at machine learning, the type of AI approach that's powering uh, so many of the headline uh, AI systems that you'll see like ChatGPT, we're learning from a lot of data. So yes, the data is important, but the data is used to train a model, right? And then this model is used to be integrated into different types of products. So if you do like Facebook did, we deleted a billion face prints, which they did. There's a $650 million settlement, so there were some reasons you know, to go delete a few things. And after they deleted the photos, which I commend, right? it shows deletion as possible, it was important to note they didn't delete the model. 
So if you still have the model that was trained on ill-gotten data, that's problematic. So you can't just stop at the data, right? And then even if you delete that particular model, if you've now open sourced it and it's integrated into other places, it continues to travel, right? The ghost of the data lives on within the models and the product integration. So when I think of deep data deletion, it's really tracing where the system goes and understanding the data is a seed. I think deep data deletion. Everybody remember that? We're starting D3? the hashtag tomorrow at 9 a.m. D3? <laughs> Um, okay, so in, in your opinion, what can be done to prevent algorithmic harm? Where, what do we do? Where should we go from here? I think at the what I've learned the most with my journey is storytelling matters. Mm -hmm. Our stories matter. And this started with me taking the step of sharing my experience of coding in a white mask. And then that led to the research, and that led to the evocative audits. And here we are. Well, you know, that escalated <laughs> quickly. It doesn't always escalate that quickly. But stories do matter, because you have to be able to name uh, what's happening, right? So putting out terminology like the coded gaze, like the X coded, and so forth, is part of naming it. So I think that's something we can all do, which is sharing our experiences with different types of AI systems. Another piece to keep in mind is the right to refusal. I see in airports all the time face scanning happening. And oftentimes, people don't know as a US citizen you have the right to opt out. If you go to the TSA's website, they'll tell you, our TSA officers are trained to treat you with dignity and respect. There will be clear signage. So I was like, OK, let's check it out. I'm a, I, I'm, I researched this. I'm looking for the signs. I find one in Spanish. Lo siento is not great on my end, right? You know, I can barely see the opt out language. Other people are not even looking um, for that sign. And in fact, the Algorithmic Justice League, we launched a campaign, fly.ajl.org, not just so we could have the cool subdomain, but it was fun, <laughs> but so people could actually share their experiences. And over 80% of the people who responded hadn't even seen those types of signs. But you can say no. And pushing back, exercising the right of refusal is really important. The other thing is the coded gaze can often be hard to see. Facial recognition, facial analysis is part of the reason I used it as an example. It's so visceral. right? I don't have to write the whole research paper. You can see my friend's face. You can see my face. There was a difference. What happened? You start the conversation. But there are so many other areas in which AI is being used that you may never know. You don't get the mortgage. You don't get the loan. And so I do think due process is important, where we have a sense of what systems are being used. And until that's mandated, you have to ask, right? If your kid is flagged for some disciplinary situation, and you turn out it was an uh, algorithm uh, involved in that, you should know. So I would, in each uh, domain you find yourself in, you might be at a, in a medical facility, et cetera. Ask them if there are any AI systems or algorithms in use. They may not know the answer, right? But it starts that uh, exploration. And it also starts a potential story for you to share to kind of join the movement. Um, so speaking of due process and potential pathways for litigation, the White House just announced their executive order on artificial intelligence yesterday. It's supposed to be one of the most comprehensive in the world. I think. We all need your take on it. Are we OK? Are we moving in the right direction? Yeah, now it's supposed to be at the White House, but I came out for you guys, you know? So it's all good. Uh, I will say it is definitely a step in the right direction because it lays out what needs to be done. So of course, the devils are going to be in the details for when it comes to uh, execution. I will say that it builds on the AI Bill of Rights that was uh, released as a blueprint uh, last year. And there, it's principles-based, right? So we want to make sure that people have protections from algorithmic uh, discrimination, right? That we have privacy and consent, that systems are actually safe and effective. And I think, importantly, that there are alternatives. Um, so you don't, for example, have to scan your face to have access to the uh, IRS. 
where I think it falls short and where I also see many conversations around AI fairness, AI safety, AI accountability falling short is this notion of redress. So I'd love to say we figure it out, right? We're working on AI prevention, you know? But what happens if we get it wrong? And what about the people who've already been harmed? So I think redress needs to be a bigger part of the conversation. And you can start that redress conversation by tracking the harms. That's why we're building this AI harms reporting platform so we have the evidentiary uh, record. And do you think it does enough to prevent harm in the first place, or was more leaning on managing harm. You tell me, actually. Let me, <laughs> what, did you, what did you think? I think managing risk and managing harm, it did a decent job at tackling, preventing it in the first place, uh, in design, in how we gather data. I think that was kind of lacking. So we're hitting it from the second end of this, this value chain or the supply chain. But from how we start, let's design things with safety in mind. Let's design and gather data uh, to avoid algorithmic harm and not wait to kind of manage it. Got it. See, and I, want, I want to know her take. <laughs> <laughs> and my final, final question <clears throat> before we move into poetry. What application of artificial intelligence are you excited about that could help humanity? Excited? Interesting. It's kind of ironic to me because all of this started because I was using AI for something fun. Right, I wanted to create an Aspire mirror so when I'd go in the m mirror in the morning, say, hello, beautiful. Or it could say, make me look like Serena Williams, now Coco Goff, OK. <laughs> All the athletes, you know, and it went wrong. Um, so I'm, <laughs> you know, so that's why we're here. Uh, some of the areas that excite me about AI, but I'm you know, cautiously optimistic are its applications for health uh, care. So I don't think it was a small um, achievement for AlphaFold, right, to predict 200 million uh, protein folding structures. And when I was a little girl, I talk about this in the book, I used to go to my dad's office and feed cancer cells. He's a professor of medicinal chemistry and computer-aided drug development, so I grew up with my dad and posters of protein folding structures all over the world and uh, all over our house. And um, yeah, he wanted me to go into chemistry, but the silicon graphics computers themselves just look so cool. So I ended up going in a different direction. So th that part excites me. But then I also think about so many of the disparities we have in health. Um, there's a company I invested in, Bloomer Tech, that focuses on women's heart health. One in three women die of cardiovascular disease, but less than a quarter of research uh, participants are women. So if we're, we know about biased data sets, right, and what can go wrong. So I do think we have to be really vigilant in order to realize the potential of AI and health, but it still uh, excites me, even though I did not continue the family trajectory, third generation PhD, but I took a, a different direction. I mean, you believed in the, the true ending of, of the protein fold, which was an algorithm. So maybe you knew all along. <laughs> Your intuition was like, there's going to be a computer for this. Yeah, I'm going to have to bring you to Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> to defend your honor. Well, that concludes all my questions. Thank you for all of your rock star answers. And I think we're really just getting started. I think now we get to hear some poetry. Absolutely. So I will go over to the podium over here really quickly. <laughs> Mic check, one, two. Y'all can hear me? OK, all right. So there are a lot of poems in the book, and I am going to a poem that is in part four. Anyone know what page the last page of part four is? Let's see. Poet versus Goliath in the wild. That's a fun chapter for sure. Let's see. That's a long book, page 200. 229. Oh, wow. All right. 
So this poem is called The Brooklyn Tenants. And the reason I chose it is because we're here at Ford Foundation. And Ford Foundation has been supporting people on the front lines of justice for some time. And the Brooklyn Tenants follow within that tradition. And I was filling out a low point in my research, not sure if you know being an academic was having that much impact, and uh, having the opportunity to share my research with them and see them use it for their own own uh, resistance campaigns was very inspiring and led to this poem, The Brooklyn Tenants. To the Brooklyn Tenants, resisting and revealing the lie that we must accept the surrender of our faces, the harvesting of our data, the plunder of our traces. We celebrate your courage. No silence, no consent. You show the path to algorithmic justice requires a league, a sisterhood, a neighborhood, book talks, hallway gatherings, sharpies and posters, coalitions, petitions, testimonies, letters, research and potlucks, dancing and music, everyone playing a role to orchestrate change. To the Brooklyn tenants and freedom fighters around the world persisting and prevailing against algorithms of oppression, automating inequality through weapons of math destruction. We stand with you in gratitude. You demonstrate that people have a voice and a choice. When defiant melodies harmonize to elevate human life, dignity, and rights, the victory is ours. Thank you. And I think we have a QA, so come on up. I'll be here. All right. Feel free, Dr. Joy. Okay. Uh, give it up for Dr. Joy and Shanae. Okay, the time is 2.50. Um, we're gonna do 10 minutes of Q&A. Please feel free to see the roving mics with Trevor and Sanyu. Um, and yeah, let's take it away. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the book, and thank you for being here in New York. Do you mind standing up sure. if you're okay with that? Yeah. Okay, uh, awesome. Um, again, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, since we're in New York, I wanted to ask uh, if you had any thoughts on the uh, AI action plan that the city just put out. Um, the city has asked for participation in um, stakeholders um, for like understanding how the city should be regulating and using AI. So I thought, um, you know, given the backdrop of that, which was maybe two or three weeks ago, and then the executive order yesterday, I thought maybe I'd love to hear what you think about what a city level government should be doing in terms of using AI responsibly, or should we just be advocating that people should not, just not use it for government at all? Uh, that's a great question and something I've thought about quite a bit within the space of facial recognition technologies. We've seen ordinances in uh, different spaces where, for example, it's probably no surprise that in Cambridge and in Boston and in Brookline, Massachusetts, the police can't use facial recognition uh, technologies. So I certainly think um, what happens at the city level, municipal level matters. My concern here is you don't want to have to live in the right city to have protections. Right, and so that's where sometimes we'll see a patchwork of frameworks, but we really do need that federal uh, legislation that gives at least a floor of protection uh, for everybody. So those are my initial thoughts. Uh, we got hands, hands, decisions. Hello, and thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm here with the Institute for Advertising Ethics and PNG. So okay. thank you for what you've done. Here's my question to you. Since most of the funding for what is AI or purports to be AI is advertising money, mm. what do you think advertisers can do with their financial power to push AI in the right direction? Oh, that's such thank a... Thank you. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. I will say, I think it's what all companies um, should be doing, including those who have the advertising uh, dollars, is to 
put the money towards AI systems that have been vetted. And too often what we'll see is that you hear the promises of AI and we buy into the belief or at least the hope of it. And I think just a, a first step is seeing if a system is fit uh, for purpose. And so that could be one approach. I want to see some uh, ladies. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm very curious, especially right now, because it's such a vital time for you know, legislation and everybody's got it on the plate. But I'm really curious about how many social scientists are involved in these conversations. You know, the reality is moving from human-centered, because human-centered could mean anything, to well-being-centered. Right, and so I'm curious about, in your experience, how many social scientists who really understand psychosocial well-being are involved in these conversations? Yeah, I will say it continues to be limited, but I was so encouraged that one of the uh, architects of the AI Bill of Rights, who's also now on the UN AI Advisory Council, is uh, Dr. Alondra uh, Nelson. And I definitely think that social science sensibility is not just nice to have, but uh, essential for sure. But it continues to be sorely lacking. <laughs> Hello. Uh, again, thank you for a lot of your the work you've uh, you. done. Um, I, Little hairstyle, by the way. I, I see like <laughs> yeah, some sim. Nice game. <laughs> I see you. Uh, oh, let me stand up. So my question is in uh, really for some of the students in the room and some of the students who couldn't be here, right? Um, given kind of the realm that we're living in right now, in the event of also still mass layoffs while the same companies who are doing these mass layoffs doubling down on AI systems, right, is just um, what is also being unearthed and exposed in the biases of who's being impacted. Um, so kind of what are some words of hope in this? And especially hearing as someone who also kind of you're in this space and you didn't have kind of like the traditional mindset uh, mind uh, said, saying that, hey, I'm maybe within being an academic, these are the hoops, these are the hoops that I want to jump. Yeah. Um, but in building resistance, kind of what are some words of hope? And also in some of the students that you are working with, yeah. just whose work is kind of inspiring you that, hey, um, in the midst of some of the, the bleakness yeah. within this AI field, like, what are you seeing here? Got it. Well, part of why I wrote Unmasking AI, because it starts with my student journey, where I'm like, I don't even know if I want to say anything, because I could get in trouble, and I might want a job <laughs> one day, you know? So it's all, it's all nice. So, so seeing that struggle is real and acknowledging it, and also acknowledging that there can be a cost um, to speaking up, but I think in terms of where there's hope. I met with President Biden in June, right, of this year, and I had a photo of Robert Williams and his two young daughters, and Robert was holding the first Gender Sage Justice Award, and President Biden's like, so is the AI racist, right? I'm like, there, there is hope once we start having the president asking some of these uh, questions. And that was a long way off from coding uh, in a white mass. And I would say in terms of words of encouragement, tech needs us. It's not the other way around. The perspectives that uh, you bring, uh, what you care about is important. And I had to find that for myself because when I first wanted to do this research, people were like, how good are your math skills? Are you sure you really want to challenge the? I had um, a bit of discouragement from very well-meaning people. You know, they just trying to look out for me, <laughs> trying to make sure I don't get hurt and all of that, right? So what helped me was having um, people like uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru. She was finishing up her PhD while I was finishing uh, my master's. And then you're saying people that I look to who are inspiring. Uh, Deb Raji, 
reached out on Facebook, right, saying, hey, I saw this. Can I do an internship with you? She didn't know we'd be going toe to toe with Amazon. So that also uh, escalated uh, quickly. But I think uh, finding support uh, in helping each other, you know, and we were there for each other as well when uh, it got intense. You might have seen some headlines and so forth. So I think that's really important. And even just being uh, proactive. Sinead reached out in my DMs and said, I see you're doing a book tour. I'm in New York now. Can I be part of the tour? I said, you want the first slot? <laughs> you know? And so that's where, uh, that's where we are. So I have a lot of uh, inspiration from people being uh, proactive in that way. So I, I mean, my name is Joyce, so I'm probably going to be generally optimistic, <laughs> you know, but I wouldn't feel uh, so discouraged because pendulum swing back and forth. And I'll just add, and it's something that's very present in your book and it's very present in your work, that we actually have the solutions. All of the problems that you discuss, you provide solutions for in the book and in your work more broadly. Nothing is a matter of physics that we can't solve all of the biggest problems we're facing, we actually have the answers. It's just about executing on them. And you make that very clear in your book. And I found that very inspiring. Thank you. Oh, wow. So many questions. Maybe. OK, maybe. That's right perfect, here. because I have a question around solutions I've been dying to ask. Were you going to call on someone? Yes, we can do two, maybe. Awesome. Um, my name is Alicia Stewart. I'm the founder of an AI-enabled uh, product that helps journalists find uh, a more representative sample of the globe on deadline. And I'm really curious, Dr. Joy, first of all, I have to say I'm so inspired by your joyful warrior mentality um, in the battles you've been through. I'm really curious to hear around, like, if you were going to create a large language model today that is accurate, right, and is representative of the global population um, and will correct identify Serena Williams, what would you think it would take and who would you call? I actually think the answer isn't larger models. I think it's smaller, more focused models. And so one of the major issues, right, when you're dealing with large language models with uh, billions or trillions of tokens is you don't have the documentation or the data provenance to have an understanding of, ex it's a bit of a mystery meat situation and then an eight ball, shake it out, see what comes out, <laughs> Ooh, toxic. All right, let's try again, shake it. All right. With more focused, uh, I would actually think of smaller bespoke uh, models uh, based on the context uh, you're looking at. So you'll have a better handle on what the potential risks are as well as tailoring it to a specific need or a specific community. So I think it's tempting to think skill, uh, scale, bigger, bigger, bigger. A lot of men in this field, you know, but <laughs> I do think thinking through other ways is helpful. Yeah, yeah. And then your question. Can you hear me? OK. Hello. Thank you so much for speaking. And I'm very inspired by all the discussions we've had so far. I worked at Meta as a software engineer for a few years. And now I'm doing research in public interest tech focused specifically on social media platforms at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. Um, so I think a lot of these tech companies are still in the process of developing these AI systems and are implementing them and using them in features as they stand now. And I really appreciate how you mentioned storytelling and really contextualizing the harms that these cause. And within the past few weeks, there was actually a very severe bug that Meta had reported where there was a translation issue where they use AI to translate um, Arabic text that said Palestinian to Palestinian terrorists. Oh. And so this caused a lot of real world harm and was just feeding into a lot of uh, you know, misinformation and false like, narratives about, you know, people that are being harmed right now in the world. Um, and so this was kind of just brushed off and said, you know, AI systems that were used to do these translations, there's an open problem with hallucinations. And um, it's still like, they're still iterating and focused on uh, fixing these systems. But I think these tech companies still need to be held accountable. Um, so what are your thoughts on while these, these like, while AI is still developing and 
making sure that there's guardrails in place so that it doesn't actually get released and have these downstream effects, um, while at the same time understanding that there's still a lot of development that's going on and that maybe there will be mistakes, but it, it should be caught as, you know, as soon as possible. Yeah, I think about the, and that's a great question, by the way. I think about the entire AI development, um, AI life cycle, right? So you have design, development, uh, deployment, oversight, and the part I want to always include, redress. So ideally, you've tested as much as possible before you put it uh, in the deployment uh, phase. But if there were consequences and penalties for making that type of egregious mistake, right? I do think companies would uh, be incentivized to be a bit more careful before you put out the mystery meat. And this goes a bit to your question, right? With large language models and other types of large scale uh, approaches uh, to AI, where you don't have the nuance, you don't have the context, and instead it's reflecting what terms are more consistently uh, used with particular groups. I think we saw this with the uh, LLM that was uh, used for some sort of rating system. And if you would see the word black women, it would get a negative sentiment. Not because black women stand alone are ne I don't think we negative, you know, right? I, I don't see it, I don't see it. But because there are so many negative associations, that was a pattern that was being uh, picked up. So I do think if there was redress and there were consequences for making those sorts of mistakes, the more costly the mistakes are, the more cautious companies would be. All right, let's give a round of applause. And Sinead Bogle. Thank you for skipping the White House to celebrate Unmasking AI. I know you all have a copy, a signed copy. Uh, but if you don't, go to unmasking.ai. Tell your friends, families, frenemies, everyone to check it out. This is the celebration. This is the book launch today on Halloween. Speaking of masking, if you're going to be talking to Dr. Joy, we just ask that you do mask up. We do have some extra masks to the uh, right side of me. I'm David Polgar with All Tech is Human, one of the partners for today's event alongside Algorithmic Justice League, who you know, and Ford Foundation as our beautiful host venue today, also the Institute for Global Politics and Random House. So thank you for everyone carving out the time today to celebrate Unmasking AI. One last time for Dr. Joy. Sinead Bobo. Thank you all. And we're going to continue to mingle here until 3.30. So thank you. Sounds good. I think I have to get my mic off. This was great.